Okay, and I'm going to pass it over to you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to uh, the last activity of day three of activities as part of Code Summer Institute, Embodied Stories, Gender, the Body and Oral History. We are very pleased to welcome you to this workshop led by Liz Miller and Emilie Trudeau that will tackle virtual reality as a method to explore feminist embodiment in confronting colonial network frameworks. I'm so sorry, super exciting. I got so excited, I mixed up your title, I'm sorry. Uh, once again, for those of you unfamiliar with uh, Force Space, welcome to our virtual channel. Uh, perhaps the best way to learn about our activities is by checking out our YouTube, and so I'll put the link in the chat momentarily. Uh, and I'll just remind you that, yeah, we're running this the show today meeting style, so you know the rules. Please engage in the space via text and by raising your hand um, and being called on to speak. We do have a moderator here to help us out today. Thanks very much, Gada. And uh, I will remind you once again that we are recording and streaming to Facebook. I'll put that link in the chat as well. Uh, and that the view there is set to active speaker for the recording. So you won't be visible unless you do uh, turn on your camera and speak. If I've missed anything, I'm sure our collaborator, professor in the Department of Art History, Cynthia Hammond, will fill in the gaps for you. Um, but Cynthia, of course, being the mastermind behind the scenes here of this week of activities. Thanks, Cynthia, for still being here. But uh, I, it's now my pleasure to pass it over, I believe, to Gada to introduce this session. Over to you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, such a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Gada Marus. I'm a, a, a associate professor at the Simone de Beauvoir Institute at Concordia University and a relatively recent affiliate of CODES. Uh, and I'm like Anna, super excited about this presentation. Um, so I'll just introduce our two uh, presenters our, our, um, for the workshop, and then I'll turn it over to them. Um, so the title, of course, is, um, is VR a useful platform for feminist embodied practices and pedagogies? And um, speaking to this is Emily Trudeau, uh, an artist, a teacher, and recent graduate of the MA program in communication studies at Concordia University. Her research creation thesis, How to Be a Settler, Using Immersive Media and Critical Pedagogies as a Means to Unsettle, is an examination of contemporary Indigenous VR uh, projects alongside original VR co-creations. And Liz Miller is a documentary filmmaker and professor who uses collaboration and interactivity as ways to connect personal stories to timely social issues. Her documentary projects on issues such as climate resilience and environmental justice have won awards and been integrated into educational curricula. Liz, Liz is a professor in communication studies at Concordia and the co-author with Stephen High and Ted Little of Going Public, the Art of Participatory Practice, published in 2017. She also co-founded the Kester Dyer Circle Visions, uh, a community initiative that offers training in storytelling and new media technologies to empower Indigenous filmmakers, activists, and artists. So welcome to you both. Um, super excited <laughs> to be here with you. Uh, so I'll turn it over to either you, uh, Liz, or Emily. Um, thank you so much, Gada, and thank you so much, Cynthia, for hosting this really beautiful encounter. We were, um, it's meant a lot for us just getting, uh, just to be a part of this wonderful group of thinkers and makers. And um, So my name is Liz Miller, and as uh, Gada just said, I'm one of two facilitators alongside Emily Trudeau for this workshop on virtual reality and feminist embodiment. I am a longtime member of CODES and a faculty in communication studies. I am currently in Montreal, Chajogi, on the unceded land of the Ganyan Gahaga Nation. And we're hosting this workshop on Zoom. Zoom's headquarters are located on the Mwekma alone territory, otherwise known as San Jose, California. And I've been using Zoom a lot, and we're using Zoom today for this amazing conference. But I did want to acknowledge that this platform 
the Silicon Valley platform does both connect and alienate us from the aims of restitution, justice, and reparation. And speaking of justice and reparation, last week, as we know, in, as many of us know, in British Columbia, with the help of radar specialists here in Canada, we became aware of the bodies of 215 missing and undocumented children that were buried at the Kamloops Indian Residential School in British Columbia. And I bring this up because events like this bring the urgency of unsettling and decolonization into sharp but painful focus. Full disclosure, this is a workshop about a workshop. So um, there are some interactive elements, um, but our goals today are to make some important connections between immersive media, decolonization, and feminist methodologies to hopefully introduce some of you to the potential of VR and other immersive media platforms, to go through a short brainstorm process on using place in VR as it might relate to your own research, to speak of the feminist ethics involved in VR practice. So those are some of our ambitious goals for the next hour. And I did actually just wanna orient myself to see is anybody here uh, at this workshop because they actually are hoping to make a VR project in the near future. Could raise your virtual hand or nod or do anything of the sorts. Not yet. Can you repeat the question? Oh, well, has anybody in this room thought to make a VR in their ongoing research? Um, is anybody here because they really uh, were hoping that they'd get some hands on? Okay. Okay, good. So we've 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 attempted to balance a little how to with uh, <laughs> some more deep ethical framework. My relationship to technology is that you can learn the technology anywhere, but to understand the ethical implications of any new technology is is sort of at the crux of a feminist practice. So I uh, am going to turn it over to Emily. Uh, bye. Hello, everyone. My name's Emily. Some things to know about me is that I'm a francophone. I was born and raised in Montreal, Georgiaki, and I, as mentioned, just finished a master's thesis on critical pedagogies, immersive media, and indigenous realities, hoping to communicate some of these to other settlers, such as myself. Um, part of the process of my MA was to really figure out what being a settler means as an identity and a role. And I undertook this because I resisted the term settler. I love my city so much. And despite my interest and my commitment to social equity and awareness, my own privilege, I just couldn't come to term that I was living on stolen lands. Um, I also come from a heritage where until about two generations ago, there were real drawbacks to being Francophones in Quebec. Um, and because of that, we often position ourselves as colonized colonizers. Uh, we think of ourselves as more native than our Anglophone counterparts. As well, in French, there isn't really a true equivalent to the word settler, which makes understanding it even more difficult, I feel. Um, on an everyday basis, I also had never significantly interacted with an Indigenous person until I was 29. And my understanding of their presence here was really grounded in the past. So I literally never had to make that connection between me, where I lived, and colonization. And I'm explaining this not to try and justify my ignorance, but because unsettling, which is one of the things we're talking about today, I um, believe first means embracing being a settler, which means feeling the guilt, feeling the anger, thinking problematic thoughts, then moving past them. And in my way, I did that through an artistic practice where I ended up writing a script for a 360 film that narrates the stories of the name of the streets in Montreal, which is pretty timely in the light of uh, the debates around statues and naming of institutions. Um, and how the name of these places can naturalize a settler colonial relationship to place. I also prepared study guides to accompany it so I could work with other settlers, especially youth, uh, struggling to figure out what this identity means to me um, and to us generally. Um, so I was inspired to do this by Paul Regan, who's the director of research for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. 
And she was one of the first to explain that settlers are responsible for unsettling themselves, ourselves. Um, unsettling being that process where we come to understand our positions within the settler colonial structure. There is also a scholar, there's also scholar um, Eric Steinman's idea of unsettling as agency where settlers disrupt settler colonialism from where they are situated. So their place of work, their own abilities. I've worked a lot in education, so that's kind of where I stood. And it's, it's one of the steps we can take towards decolonization. That's our work, our responsibility. Um, so this is particularly relevant in Canada right now because despite public inquiries into our residential schools for six years, um, others on missing and murdered Indigenous women, none of this really made a large scale impact uh, in Canada um, and even less so in Quebec. Uh, however, in the past few months, there have been incidents that are entering the mainstream opinion. So there's the mass grave that Liz mentioned earlier. And in Quebec specifically, a few months ago, there was an Atikamek woman named Joyce Echaquan who filmed her own death while she was being insulted by health workers. And the term, how come I've never heard this before, is everywhere. So there's a real opportunity here to mobilize that mix of indignation, outcry, and public coverage. Um, so as someone with a lot of experience as an educator, a part of my responsibility was collaborating with Liz on a workshop where we'd be working with First Nation filmmakers to create their first immersive film. Um, which she will now be telling you about. However, just a small note, um, I want to mention that unsettling is a process that never ends. And I do tend to put my foot in my mouth and I have done so a lot, uh, but I'm always open to feedback or criticism. So just, just voicing this little discomfort, discomfort. Over to you, Liz. Mm. Thank you, Emily. And I just want to mention how amazing it's been to work with Emily over the last five years, somebody who has extensive experience in camps and in um, lots of different interactive uh, pedagogical activities. So um, Emily and I worked, this workshop today is part of an ongoing reflection about the work that Emily and I have been involved with um, that we've done through the Circle Visions project which we initiated in 2016, Kester Dyer and I at Concordia. Um, each summer, we hold an annual summer institute in the communications department at Concordia. Emily has been a trainer with me for several years. And we do these workshops with our partner, Wapakoni Mobile. And maybe you can move to the next slide, Emily. Um, they have a really unique film production initiative for Indigenous youth, which converts four recreational vehicles into mobile studios. And they do month long stops in remote rural communities. The group supports Indigenous artists, community makers to conceive, produce, edit and exhibit their own films. And Wapikoni has been around for 16 years and made an enormous contribution to the distribution of Indigenous films that we screen in classrooms, festivals, even conferences like this. So we've collaborated with Wapikoni um, to do this one week media making workshop at Concordia that brings together about five to eight emerging filmmakers. And two years ago, we led the 360 degree filmmaking that workshop that we will be talking about today. During COVID, we led an online podcast workshop. And what we wanted to do is share some of our approaches, methods, and insights from this process. And we wanted to briefly point out um, that we are thinking in conversation with other initiatives throughout Canada that are trying to find that place in between narrative sovereignty, um, this kind of connection to, between cultural awareness and technological training. And the I Am Four Lab is an inspiration. It's uh, short for Indigenous Matriarch Four Lab, which was founded in 2018 by Cree Metis filmmaker Loretta Todd and four other media matriarchs, um, including a journalist, an ethnobotanist, and a theater maker. And a key motivation that she's described for this lab has been to involve women from both, uh, primarily from the community. 
uh, to shift the balance in a tech industry where there are still very, very few women and even less indigenous women. And so drawing on the wisdom of other initiatives like this, and I'll go to the next slide, we have uh, as, uh, a set, as, a, as, a, as a settler group, you know, as a group with a settler orientation, we have attempted to um, use methods such as bringing in indigenous artists in residence, um, hiring indigenous trainers, um, using the workshop to involve and convene indigenous students who are studying film who are already at Concordia. So this idea of building community, using media technologies to build community. And each year, the method of our workshop is different so that it's accumulative. So anybody who has taken a previous workshop can come back to another. And we've seen a lot uh, what happens at Wapakoni is it's their first encounter and what we see our role is, is building that kind of confidence of becoming a mentor to others. Um, so I'm going to turn it back to Emily, who's going to talk about how we see our methodology within a feminist framework. Just wanted to not speak because I was muted. Okay, so one of the things that Liz mentioned was that it was really important for us to use um, that feminist framework to build our workshop, uh, partly because we were always trying to keep in mind our positions as white uh, settler women, and what that and the resources we have access to meant as to our accountability as um, white settler women. So for instance, we really tried to prioritize care and responsiveness which was actually one of my main role during the workshop. So I called everyone before they arrived to make sure there was that personal connection from the very start. Uh, we organized spaces where uh, we took time to get to know each other. Uh, we made time for food, for a relationship to develop. Um, so for instance, once we ordered moose meat and bannock for one of the meals, which ended up being this really funny occasion to share everybody's favorite recipe, to argue about ingredients. Um, I also kept in touch with all of the participants. Uh, you know, when I was traveling, I'd send them postcards, uh, so on and so forth. And one of the participants, actually my roommate now. So um, during the workshop, we also tried to be really responsive. So we were initially being like, needs to be really process oriented. It's all about learning. And then when the participants got there, they said, no, we want a finished project. This needs to be intensive. So we hustled instead. Um, so again, just going over what Liz said a little bit, we really wanted to create that safer space within the settler colonial institution so that the, our, the, the indigenous filmmakers could take advantage of the university's resources and to teach them a new media that really allows them to situate themselves in the present and in the future. And by that, I mean that one of the trope that we were working to contest is manifest destiny, which we know is the idea that indigeneity is doomed to disappear, that um, progress and the future is really antithetical to indigeneity. So by working, um, by involving indigenous filmmakers in a technology like VR, that despite the simplicity of the camera is still seen as really new and exciting and unattainable. It's a way to pre-mediate and place them as actors and creators in the future. Um, it also offered a group a chance to move beyond victim narratives, to create work that moves beyond it, which, you know, victim narratives are, are telling stories about what happened to Indigenous people is obviously super important to know about, um, but it's also mostly what we focus on here anyways. And that ends up being really reductive um, because it, it ignores the strong movements of indigenous resurgence. And again, it, it contributes to that trope that they're just disappearing. Um, so finally, media is not neutral. And right now, this kind of new technology is usually aimed at gaming or porn and they're coded as white and male. So providing the space for what ended up being primarily women to own this tool and within which to ground their stories really resonated with our feminism and 
you know, we were able to brought forward some really cool and interesting alternative stories. Um, so, Emily, if you want to see if we're going to be successful at bringing up a clip, and just to remember when you share your screen to share audio and the other. Um, so I'm just going to, we, we thought, like, we've been talking a lot. I would love to show you a short clip uh, from one of the pieces that resulted from this week-long workshop. So each filmmaker over the period of five days actually made 360 films. Two of them have been in festivals throughout Canada and already won awards. One of our younger women woman won the, um, um, I think it was like the interactive award. So there's something interesting about using new technologies to give uh, makers a chance at being amongst the first generation to be trying these things out. Um, so the clip that we're gonna show is from Mi'kmaq filmmaker, Naomi Kondo and her Anishinaabe collaborator, Craig Commanda. Craig Commanda is also a student at Concordia. And the film is based on a script Naomi wrote where a young woman begins her day with a smudging ceremony to honor her great grandparents whose ceremonial practices were suppressed. So we've just selected a 49 second clip, but um, this work is available free online. Um, all of the work that we that came out of the workshop is available on the Wapakoni website. So let's see if we have success playing this. This is Melina's piece. I am home between the trees. Oh, shoot, sorry. <laughs> um, there okay. we go. Amazing. In the morning, I prepare my medicines to smudge and give thanks for another day. I wonder what it would have been like if my father, my aunties and uncles would have been allowed to pray this way. If my great grandmother would have been able to transmit the ways in which she was an important part of the circle as the direct connector to the spirit world and how she holds sacred ceremonies and knowledge of medicines that would have healed the wounds of intergenerational trauma and scraped knees. Okay, that's a super short clip, um, but it just gives you a, a little bit of a taste of what we're talking about. Um, just to remem remember, I don't know how many people in this room have actually done 360, like put the headset on and been in this kind of immersive context. Most people. Okay, there's a few, it looks like not everybody has. So I'm just gonna remind us that um, Basically, when you're in the 360 space, you are the camera, like it's it's a different positionality. And so the camera's not looking outside inward, but is inside looking around in around a circular sphere. So we talked about this in the workshop as as an opportunity. And in the past, 2D video or what is now called flatty, flatty video, <laughs> um, the ones for taken the once uh, taken for granted boundary in consumer video, this like what's inside the frame, what's out the, outside the frame has now expanded into a circle. So I, for Naomi, it was this opportunity to really ground her ideas of bringing past, present and future into conversation in this circular space. So thinking about circular time with circular space. And in our discussions, we talked about how this might complement this idea of a fixed linear settler colonial version of history. The second thing that as a group we spoke a lot about um, that I think is also an affordance in VR is the idea of the perceptual affordance. This idea that there's a heightened sense of being in place or in this space. The second, you know, first she, she, she begins in this room, um, it's really just a dorm room, but then we go into the woods and you're really on the ground with the leaves and the idea is there's a heightened sense of being in a place or a space. Um, and filmmaker Brenda Longfellow has written about this extensively and talked about that 
2D cinema sometimes can reinforce a disconnect between humans and their environment, something that we see as outside. Um, and that 360 has the potential, it's not a given, to invite users into a reciprocal relationship with both land and time. And indigenous thinkers like Leroy Little Bear have also suggested that immersive media prioritizes space that therefore can align itself with indigenous worldviews. So this was a prompt that we had a lot of fun over lunches and thinking through what are the affordances of this space. And uh, now I'm going to turn back to you, Emily. Great. So we've we've talked a lot, um, and we would now like to see what kind of story you might be interested in by using some of the prompts that ooh, sorry by using some of the prompts that we've used in a previous workshop. So I'm just gonna go down. So if you have a, a pen and paper around you, that will be useful. So our first prompt would be for you to think about stories um, about places that matter to you or that you have personal access to. Um, st uh, stories that might weave together personal and public histories together. One, uh, an example of this would be the piece I wrote for my MA, which is called uh, Une Histoire de Rue or A History of Streets. Uh, where I bring viewers to six different locations in Montreal, to which I'm either connected to or that have historical relevance to the settler colonial context. So at each place, I speak to the viewer and explain the history behind the name of the street. It begins with the street I grew up on, and it ends on a street whose name was changed last year. So the original street name was Amherst, who was a general who suggested using smallpox infected blankets with indigenous tribes uh, to kill them. Um, and it became a, a word which is called, a, it became Mohawk word uh, called Adad again, that means kinship. And throughout the piece, my goal was to emphasize uh, obviously my personal connection to Montreal, but also the invisible and hyper-visible framework that those kind of toponymic choices can create in a city. So I'd like to take about a minute for you to try and jot down some ideas of, again, places that matter to you, that, have, that you have unique access to, and um, potentially that weave together your own personal or your research, your researched people's personal and public histories. So jot away. I'm looking at the faces writing. So if your camera's closed and you're done, maybe just put a thumbs up or a little face. Great, Mohammed's done, Amy's done, <laughs> Rebecca's done, super. So I'll move on to the next prompt, which is a, a little bit more complicated. Um, so I will ask you to think about a speculative or abstract place that can trouble or open up new understandings. Um, I'm gonna start by showing you a trailer of an example. So I'm gonna share screen again. And while she's doing that, I'll just uh, go to say a lot of uh, VR makers have 
created speculative spaces. So we kind of used the immersive space of VR to imagine future spaces, um, especially, yeah, here we go. So this is called Unseated Territories. Honestly, the favorite piece that I've that I've ever seen, um, and what what it does is, sorry, wait first. It's a piece by Paisley Smith and Lawrence Paul Uchtwilipton, and it was originally meant as a comment on climate change, but when I experienced it, experienced it, it also struck me as kind of a settler's experience of colonialism. So as you saw in the film, you're giving a set of hand and you're throughout the film, you're throwing. And at first they're beautiful kind of globs of color and you're literally creating the world around you with this beautiful imagery by um, Mr. Yuxuan Lupton. But as you go on and without you really being able to control it, what you're throwing starts to destroy the world around you. And the sense of presence in the piece for me anyways, created a really strong connection to the space I was in and seeing how my action contributed to its destruction really um, brought home the alternative history where as a settler, I wasn't just bringing progress or improving the world. I was inevitably linked to its corruption despite the fact, despite the fact that I'm you know, not Christopher Columbus. So I would like to take a minute for you to think about that uh, fictional or abstract place. Um, for instance, maybe Montreal 50 years from now, uh, other places. So I'm again gonna look at the faces writing or not to gauge where we're at. And I will put a link to the trailer uh, for those who might wanna see it again. And this is a harder one. I'll just give you one other example. There's a, a really fabulous feminist collective. They call themselves Hyphen Labs. And they've created a futurist neuro speculative um, lab that's modeled after like a women's hair salon, but instead you're being reprogrammed. So there's just an enormous amount of creativity about future spaces. There's also a future space, um, Lisa, what's Lisa's last name, Emily? Um, Nakamura? Li no, um, Lisa Jackson. Um, Jackson. Lisa yeah. Jackson has created a future Toronto. It's sort of a dystopic uh, future where the only thing that has survived is languages and it's indigenous languages. So there's, I think, a really beautiful play uh, with, um... anyway, so we thought this would probably be a harder one, <laughs> but I'll be quiet so you can think.
think at least one person has written all they could write. What about the others? Let's keep going just so we get through. Uh... Okay. Just trying to be really responsive to the crowd, feminist framework and all. Um, okay, so we have two more prompts. And so the next prompt would be a place that weaves together personal and public histories. Uh, I'm going to give you a short example. It's called Another Dream by Tamara Shogaolu. And definitely did not say that right. But this, so it's a 360 piece that actually uses oral history to tell the personal story of a lesbian couple that's fleeing Egypt. And the piece really beautifully conveys the themes of home, uncertainty, and displacement. And it also uses the interactive device of language. So you're asked to actually write Arabic words to move forward in the story. So part of the embodied feeling is your connection to language. So again, I'd like you to jot down some ideas and these can be either related to yourself or your research or just general interests of places that weave together personal and public histories. Margaret, thank you so much for the smile. You're making me feel really confident when I talk. I'm gonna give everyone about 10 more seconds. I'm rushing you. All right, moving on to the last prompt. Um, so that last prompt would be um, slightly similarly a place with a significant but less known history. And uh, the example I want to give is actually available for free on YouTube, um, only if you're using Chrome. And I really suggest you watch it. It's amazing. Um, it's by a local company in Montreal, and it was directed by Roger Ross Williams. So you're put into this space called Ben's Chili Bowl, who, was, who is a landmark Black-owned and operated restaurant that was included in a guide for Black travelers during segregation as a safe space. And as a viewer, you're allowed to enter that sacred black safe space and engage with conversations um, of people around you that normally wouldn't be accessible to you, especially if you're you know, not black. So um, again, last time, uh, I would like you to think of a place with a significant, but perhaps hidden history. And I'm just going to say one tiny little thing. So in this particular VR, it's a beautiful example of uh, an interview. So you're literally at the table in, engaged in this interview. So they sort of have this reflexive environment that makes you feel like you're listening. And so you see the person being interviewed and you see the interviewer. So again, you feel like you're at the table of an important historical moment being that's resurfacing that's also connected to a place
Let's take about 15 more seconds. And anybody who has the courage, uh, we're going to ask you to share your projects. <laughs> the one that you think has the best, uh, that of all the different prompts, you'd really love to see happen. And usually I try to scare you into sharing, but I can't do it now. So scare yourself into sharing. <laughs> And maybe Emily, we can stop um, screen share for a moment. And done. All right, who wants to share? You can start in the chat. <laughs> all right, let's see. So, oh, great. You want to talk about all of them? You want to talk about all of them? Great. Let's hear. <laughs> I don't think I don't. I think we somebody else should start. <laughs> No, Cynthia, we're not scared. playing that game. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well then I'll tell you about my, um, I'll tell you about my abstract place that can open up a new understanding in the future. And what I imagine, Sean already knows about this. What I'm imagining is a future world and it is somewhat dystopian in which um, the, fundament are, the fundamental Western European derived understanding of power and order is completely upended and humans are no longer at the center of the universe. Huh. And in fact, it is non-human life that becomes the center of everything, but there's an invert, it's not just, oh, now we understand we were wrong. It's more that because things have gone so wrong for so long that the power balance has to invert. And so any harm at all that is caused to animals, to living things, whether they are thought to be sentient or not today, um, creates a, a negative effect. Of pain. There's, there's pain or loss in the human world. And the only exception to that would be in cultures, especially indigenous cultures, where there is has long been a sense of stewardship rather than control and ownership. So the future world would be, um, the image that came to mind for me would be, would be animal centered, but that doesn't actually go quite far enough. It would have to be uh, non-human centered, but that word still centers the human. <laughs> so that would be, that would be my, my abstract place, I don't know how abstract that is, but that one that I would hope would open up a new understanding, which is for me, you know, our, it's not all humans, but the dominant human sensibility is that all this is for us. All this is for us to ruin. But in the future world that I imagine, we don't have that. We don't have that luxury or power. In fact, we are all in service of the non-human. Uh, I think that would actually translate super well with an immersive media, just okay. because of that non-centeredness of the great job. Well, all your examples were so inspiring. Okay, uh, thank you for letting me go first. I wow, that. thank you for sharing that, Cynthia. Yeah. Um, we had uh, Bima Doshka who shared as well in the chat. Um, I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit or chat only. Hi. Um, no, I just thought um, I was quickly just jotting things down um, and it wasn't until I got to the end and I looked back and read through and I had messaged Cynthia privately and I said, I think I wrote a poem. It's, it was a strange exercise, but when I read what I wrote, I'm like, oh, it's beautiful. Like, I don't know how you plan that. That's amazing. So I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and I really love your work and uh, I want to, I want to participate more. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Do you, do you want to just read what you have there? It's so beautiful. I'd love to hear the poet. <laughs> the poem. Sure, I'll, I'll try. Um, Chief's Point, Lake Huron Shore, the flats of the Saugeen River, the Catholic Church on my reserve, a full graveyard that is not marked in any way, with the ancestors from my dream, underwater with the Manitous. I'm stuck in the present and past. What is the future? 
a time traveling flying canoe. Worlds of frequencies or songs, the powwow, a place that weaves oral history, personal and public histories in ceremony, Chief's Point. So it sort of just went full circle and I don't know how you got me to do that, but thank you for that. I feel really, I feel good right now. Thank you. Mm, that's really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all of those uh, potential places and how they come together. Uh, Mohammed, yeah. Well, thank you. Can you hear me though? Okay, well, it was so inspiring. And uh, at the same time, I was imagining and criticizing my own thoughts that you were asking about imagining the place. At first, I was imagining the streets themselves and the people who live on the streets because of different circumstances and, uh, and they don't have access to the house. And uh, I was imagining the Cabot Square that we uh, have a kind of imagination of that square, but different actions and activities happen there. And uh, mostly we uh, assign some functions to some places, but some places we cannot assign functions like under the bridge, I don't know, the streets that we pass. And uh, those uh, functions that, different people and define it in different uh, ways. And uh, uh, I think the essence of the place would be our bodies that we take action and create the space. And, uh, and uh, I was imagining that what if we put it the other way that while I wanna imagine a place that I have gone to different places, maybe it's only for me one place and this is my body and presence in different uh, places. And if we change the scale, uh, if I have gone to different places in Montreal, it's only one place Montreal. In Canada would be <laughs> different cities, but we can change the scale and it would be one uh, point or even we can call it the airs that uh, however I have gone to different countries, but while I change the scale, I would be one point. Also in terms of time, I was thinking that, okay, if I imagine my whole life, it can be one point into the history. And um, um, yeah, and uh, my, uh, maybe uh, what I was imagining that uh, instead of assigning functions to the place, how about we trust our bodies and we, take action at the present uh, moment and create a space together. And that space can always transform to something new based on our uh, everyday life. And how about everyone and, uh, and as Cynthia says, all other creatures on the earth have this right to create their own place and time. But actually <laughs> your I was imagining myself and other people that have a kind of uh, big atmosphere with themselves. And while we go to different places and we make something, we are creating the space and this is what it is. And while we are not present, there is no place and time. Mohammed, one of the things that really comes forward from your like amazing imagination, <laughs> those are so many ideas, thank you. But what really impacts me as you're speaking is this idea of polyphony, like polyphony of place and polyphony of people in place. You know, this idea of not just the singular construction of one place, but how we are, our identities are made up of many places. And what does it mean to have more than one person in a 360 or immersive place? So I feel like you're kind of busting the norms of what this technology does now. But um, I, I don't know, Mohammed, if you're in Montreal, but uh, Wapakoni, our partner, is this summer, they're building a 360s dome space. So a lot of developers and organizations, and actually it's scientists who have first and foremost, uh, really been thinking beyond the headset into the dome, which harkens back, of course, to 
other moments and installations, but uh, this idea of like these more immersive spaces that we can be in together. So like, you just busted my imagination open. Thank you very much. Um, and, and brought in a lot of uh, new concepts too, of uh, some of the limitations of the headset now and it's sort of singular use versus it's collective use. And you also brought in this really important theme that we're going to get to about the body. Where's the body in this medium? So, wow, thank you. Any, anybody else? I would, hi everybody. Hi Shauna. Um, nice to see you. This is fantastic. Um, big fan of your work and I'm so happy you're doing this. And I guess I would just say really quickly, that, um, just to pick up on a bit of Cynthia, because Cynthia and I do so much work together about this kind of non-human centered worlding. And I'm, you know, in the very, very early days of just making a lot of mistakes and playing with, you know, how even the, a 360 camera sits on the tripod and how we move with that, but it's super fun. And um, in my neighborhood, so this is kind of the non-human centered, I suppose, idea for maybe an abstract space, but very much about like how to, how to, how do you really meaningfully make um, the content with a community? So in my neighborhood in Oshlaga Maisonneuve, there's this, you know, doomy gloomy project. Um, the city's got to put a, a railway above ground railway track in the, I mean, across the city, right? And um, just to say super quickly that there's these boisy vimon, uh, these kind of, these little mini woods um, not far from where I live. And so the community here or people in this neighborhood are starting to create some activism and resistance. And actually the, the posters that they're wheat pasting everywhere and they're everywhere, like overnight, it's fantastic, actually feature this beautifully illustrated wolf or what I, where I'm, I'm pretending to, or, or you know, reading as a wolf um, and, and some flowers, beautiful illustration I can share later. So I'm really interested in how we use, you know, some ephemera, some visual culture that gets created through activism and, and also archives that we can, you know, you can kind of start to think about how do you transpose um, that, con that, that material, um, which needs to kind of move in. I'm very interested in the fiction, being able to transform our experiences or our, our, or our yeah, our experiences um, to where we live and, and and anyway, so those are, I have a lot of questions, but these are the kinds of connections I'm making in terms of like, how do you actually start, you know, creating content for this, um, this kind of work that is, is, is meaningful. Um, anyway, that's what I want to say. So I'm kind of imagining that this site, its future is not, there is no REM railway line or whatever it's called, but there's actually like, you know, um, these, these animals that are, you know, native to that site in that this area of the city that you know, maybe host us humans somehow um, and our visits there. That's all. Mm. Well, thank you, first of all, for bringing that case study in Montreal uh, to the attention of everyone in the space. I've been there myself. And one of the prompts that we didn't use, um, but that we have in other workshops is a place undergoing transformation. Um, so I think that's super, super relevant to this one. Um, and that taps into a lot of people who are thinking through issues like you are, Shauna, of like the, the power dynamics of place, the gentrification of places, um, the contradiction of places. And you made me think of another feminist VR artist who I'll share the link here, who was working in Saratoga Springs around a racetrack. And she was really interested in the 360 frame because the circular frame of the racetrack and as a feminist, what so so what Emily and I had to learn how to do is stitch, and this is how it works. And I anybody who's done 360, you have to stitch your cameras together. So the first VR I made was six cameras I had to stitch together. Then we moved to consumer cameras, which are just two cam two angles stitched together. But what this feminist uh, Aggie Ibrahim decided to do um, was reveal the stitch, and so she uses the unstitched part of the frame to say. So, so she 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 looks at the lives of the people who tend to the horses and she looks at the lives of the people who bet on the horses and who man, you know who who were sort of more the power brokers in the city and it's an it's an unstitched connection so i'm just thinking sean of your project of like the present and the unstitched past or you know how do we play with the mechanics of this frame to reveal these unresolved tensions in a community 
and I'll definitely be sure to share uh, that example. It's one of my favorite pieces. Somebody else used, um, um, so, so there's all this hiding that you do, right? Like, so there's the traces of the camera and there's the top sometimes has an opening. And I saw one piece where a feminist filmmaker imposed a, a sort of fourth view of a power, you know, of, of something at the top looking into us. You know, and this is something, Cynthia, you could sort of play with this, this idea of like a future presence. So really kind of thinking about in this spherical, in this globe, spherical circle, how are, how are we really reshifting uh, pr uh, positionality, recentering, reshifting, and, and really making use as, as feminists have done in media representation, revealing the processes, revealing the seams, revealing the contradictions. But, we're, mentioning, but, we're mentioning yeah. a lot of pieces. We'll try and maybe to those who are interested, make a yes. document to send you so that you have access to them. Yes, yes. And we are happy to consult too, because we've learned a lot along the way. And uh, well, we're still learning. Let's just be clear. Um, is there anybody else who wanted to share? It's so nice to hear and surface the creative ideas because they can feel really fragile when they come to you. But uh, once you share them in a group, <laughs> suddenly you're like, hmm, maybe I want to make that piece. I, I just have to say that I know Margaret is a very spatial thinker and a very creative thinker. So if you wanted some encouragement, Margaret, without trying to put you on the spot. <laughs> um, I was thinking about this part of the mountain that I've been going to, thinking of this um, nature spaces. Um, a friend brought me to the, this place to look for mushrooms um morels and then i was thinking about what other medicinal plants are on the mountain like um personally and trying so i went back to try and find and try and identify and i wonder about mm -hmm. also who is using that part of the park like a lot when i was observed when i went back to visit i noticed you know there are a lot of dog walkers it's it's the part of the park just above Outremont. and so wondering what those people are thinking when they go there, um, if they're thinking of the history or thinking of the plants, if they're just using it, like what is, how are they using it? What's the purpose of it for them? And wondering if, yeah, maybe a VR video of that space could engage these other elements that maybe people aren't thinking about or uh, maybe share some history share some um, indigenous uh, understanding of the, uh, the plants or the land or the history of that space. Uh, I haven't seen any sort of plaques or markers of the history even just at the beginning of the park. Yeah. So I'm just, that's just a personal place too that I like to go for myself yeah. to get into nature out of my neighborhood. So. Yeah, that's the place I'm thinking right now. <laughs> I love what you're saying, Margaret. Um, there's a whole language that is about kind of teleporting um, you into another space. But what I hear you say is also connecting different spaces. Um, and I think that's a really beautiful use of, uh, that could be a really future beautiful use. It's like, um, how could you connect a, a, a space on the mountain with a a, a, a past space or um there's a kind of i guess what i'm trying to say is there is a kind of sort of spatial transporting that we can do um that brings awareness to knowledges that aren't being foregrounded um but i love especially how you just spoke to a space that you've you've been to and emily and i have talked a lot about this like in no means do we see this as a substitute for going for a walk on the mountain uh, we did a collaboration with the um, indigenous curator at the uh, Botanical Garden here in Montreal, and she wanted to just take headsets to shelters and uh, urban spaces as a kind of way of saying, here's this, we, we did a, a 360 of the Three Sisters Garden, and um, she kind of talked us through this, the history and the kind of context of the space. And then she took the headsets to just urban spaces and said, I want, 
it was it was a it was a it was an invitation to be like here's this space do you want to actually come visit the space with me so it was we never think of it as like substitute for the real thing <laughs> just a sort of innovative portal into um into that um the other thing I just wanted to mention before we go to the ethics part of this uh, is something Cynthia said, which is its potential to foreground other beings. And um, I worked on a piece in the Everglades with an indigenous uh, um, interpreter and water activist. And we had kind of moved. She was a guide. She was a tour guide in the Everglades. And we'd moved through all these spaces together. And, and, and we, I think we'd moved through like five spaces before we tapped into something really exciting. And she was just like, oh, here's this space where there's a lot of mother alligators. And I have this way of, I was like, are you, what, wow, how do you know that they're the mother alligators? And she was like, just wait a second. And she did this call and the call was of a baby alligator in distress. And so when the mother alligators heard that call, like suddenly the mother alligator is like looking at us in the boat. And so it opened up this idea for us about the camera being in this, you, the user, the camera being in relationship to being and person in a space, you know, so rather, so, so it was about like thinking about the choreography of the camera and that you could be upset about this idea that she's faking the sound of a, of a baby alligator in distress. I understand that perfectly. Um, but we, it was a different way to think about how are, what are we putting in, in interaction in a space. So another example, after we were inspired by Betty and this interaction and um, was we went to a swimming hole where these um, amazing salty fish, uh, fishermen fish in the same water hole as the alligators. And so we put the camera, this was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life, but we put the camera kind of in between these two players. So it was sort of leveling the perspective. You are in between this alligator who's looking around the lake for the fish and this fisherman who's casting um, the reel. So again, just sort of trying to implicate you in a space. How, how are people doing that? And I think that might be a really good way for me to get into um, a sort of just a short overview. What do you think, Emily? Of, of kind of some of the things that we've learned from others and that we've been thinking through around the ethics of VR. Um, so, the first thing I just want to um, say again, even though I've said this uh, already once, is that, uh, and, I, and I know some of you already know this, but the, the real, the, the shift is that the user is inside, um, looking around in a space. And so these questions about like, how do you help the audience understand who they are in relation to the place? Um, how do you give the viewer enough context to feel comfortable, invited, welcome? And what are the ethics of the space that you're curating and creating? And so uh, maybe we could go to the next slide. Um, the very first piece I did as a, as a 360 piece, it was a piece made by local makers here in Montreal called Nomads. And basically uh, there were six uh, spaces around the world that you could go to of nomads or indigenous communities uh, who move from place to place. And I put the headset on and I was suddenly in the bedroom of somebody's house and I was unbelievably uncomfortable. I was like, I don't really feel like this is, I, I felt like it was a, a return to an uncomfortable ethnographic uh, film of the past and, and, and doubled by my sense of having been in a space that I wasn't invited to. So this began, it kind of like a newly configured alignment with a colonial gaze. It, it, it wasn't comfortable. And, and this was the early iteration. And I think all of us, including the makers of this particular piece have learned from these early pieces. Um, but what it did in my own um, projects and what it did in our trainings was really to emphasize like whose voice, what voice, and the idea of situated presence. And the way we teach it is like, you're almost like a guide. So you sometimes when you're, if you are in your piece, how are you pointing out spaces of relevance? How do you orient the, the person into the space? But just working against this kind of romance of teleporting into somebody else's space. Um, so this is an old uh, ethic in feminist practice, the situated voice, but now we're thinking through this concept of the situated presence. Um, 
the second piece, this maybe the next slide, is um, this idea of the body. And so a huge consideration in making VR is the user's body. So you're the tripod, like you, the user, are the tripod. You're in the center of the space and you actually lose your body temporarily. Um, so a lot of different makers have um, been playing around with this. Like in one piece, I was in a lab coat in a, um, you know, so I, I was in somebody else's clothes. Another piece, I was sitting in a, a, a person who was clearly uh, um, asking for food and I was in the positionality of somebody who's obviously hungry and asking for food. I'm gonna be honest with you, I felt really uncomfortable about that particular positionality. So there's been a lot of shifting ethics about how this works. Um, this is a really interesting piece. It's called the machine to be another, where you actually switch bodies with somebody else. And the thing about this piece is that they are foregrounding dialogue and conversation before and after the experience. So it's, it's about body exchange, but it's about curated, careful body exchange and feminists like Lisa Nakamura have really talked against this idea of body tourism or what she calls toxic re-embodiment. And she really was speaking to these kind of early facile claims that people like Chris Milk, who uh, started this very cool distribution platform called Within, it's some of the most amazing work is in this platform called Within. But in a TED talk in 2015, he was like, VR is the empathy machine that makes us more human. And so a lot of feminists came back with this idea of how Nakamura puts it, feeling good about feeling bad, that if we focus, if to feel becomes synonymous with to understand, to address and to change, it replaces a more critical viewing and a call to consider structural injustice. So the sort of first wave of VR was like empathy, you can feel someone else and this is inherently good and this is inherently about social change. And feminists have really pushed back uh, to say, what are the limits of empathy and what are the limits of proximity? And how do we trouble that? So we've been thinking alongside a lot of these uh, cutting edge makers and cutting edge theorists who are really kind of um, helping us to think about some of the uh, ethical issues. And I'll show one other slide, um, which is kind of um, these other ethical considerations. Of course, a very important first one that we already spoke to is like, who gets to make, actually, we haven't spoken to this. Well, yes, Emily spoke to it. Who gets to make, whose voice, whose body? So these are the very basic firsts. Um, and, and this leads to the question of um, the labs that are uh, emerging, the feminist labs in particular, of who shapes the rhetorics of emergent forms? And you know, why should we be playing with the master's tools anyway? Can we have an influence them on them, especially at an early stage when they're moving and evolving? And this gets back to our colleague, Jason Lewis's idea, as if we kind of, if we're not in the sandbox playing, then we also are missing an opportunity for the future development of tools that we create. So learning, you know, the rhetorics is sort of an important part of this. Um, there's a whole ethics of, um, reception um, right now you know uh, the first wave is about this oculus headset and not only is this kind of a scare thing right now with covid like passing these these little headsets they're they're personal they're consumer based and they're individual and so you know is it what are the tensions of moving from the sort of embodied space of a cinema of let's say 360 people going through a shared experience to the solo experience of an individual with a headset um, that makes me jump down to what are the models for advocacy emily and i have been researching and thinking through how vr is actually being used uh, to create social change and what we're seeing is like a lot of fanfare around um you know putting the headset on a, a single individual maker who suddenly feels something um about let's say a refugee girl in a camp and uh so, so even just the claims of the, le of the forms of, of, of advocacy are still in a very early stage. What if your advocacy goal is coalition building? How can we use the affordances of immersive media towards other goals beyond influencing a single decision maker? And Emily and I have talked a lot about what happens before and after the headset. So one of the things that Cynthia would love 
about this form is that you don't need you don't even need human voices in the space you could go to a space you can be in a place um but what how do you set it up and how do you debrief after is kind of something that a lot of people are thinking um and do you need that um so uh, what happens before and after the headset and then a last sort of wave of feminist thinkers are thinking about the whole idea of desensitization. So you have um, a lot of uh, individuals who are taking us to sites of uh, relevance through a specter of journalism. Um, but there's other feminists who are like, well, is the viewer prepared? Are we re-traumatizing viewers? If we take you to a site, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, anyway, like, like, like after a shooting or before a shooting or a racially traumatic environment. Um, how, who are we re-traumatizing? How are we re-traumatizing? So there's still quite a lot of ethical issues that are in formation as we use and pilot um, this, uh, this form. So I'm just gonna go back to Emily to just uh, offer us, we'd actually like to have a moment where we talk through and think through these ethical issues together, but Emily had just a few more things that she wanted to say as well. Man, that unmute button. Um, so just basically, I want to end the presentation part by circling back to Indigenous makers, because a lot of them have already built a small but really impressive collection of VR works that use the affordances we spoke about to play with conceptions of time and space and to use the locality of virtual reality to parallel Indigenous oral storytelling practices. And um, 2D cinema can reinforce a paradigm where humans are really unconnected to their environment, but immersive media has the potential to embed a viewer in this kind of recipro reciprocal, this is the French coming out, the reciprocal relationship with uh, land and time. And Indigenous creators have argued that it really allows them to carve a space outside of the settler colonial system that underpins uh, their status as other. So finally, the, the mere use of this technology is in and of itself a type of unsettling and even decolonization of the media space. The, the novelty of immersive media is, you know, obviously time specific, it's novel now, but the fact that indigenous artists are using it now provides that counter narrative of indigenous practices not being able to evolve or belonging to a really archaic time that's you know, justifiably taken over by our superior settler technologies. Um, and then finally for reals, so one last thing is that immersive media is still just a media. And for the most part, I'd suggest that, especially if you're eager to do VR in an ethical way, um, it's always helpful, and that, that's something I was really keen to do with my own piece, to offer either background information on what you're sewing or some sort of guiding reflex, reflection prompts. Um, because, you know, as like Liz mentioned of the criticism of immersive media, it's not, it's not a panacea. It doesn't do things on its own necessarily, just like any other film um, or TV or whatever can lead to things that you're not necessarily hoping for. That's it. That's the end of my talking. Um, so I don't know, we have a group discussion plan, but we're also really open to questions or comments. So Liz, I don't know what you'd prefer to begin with. I think if there's any, um, like, as I said, I think we've spent the, the last five years thinking really deeply about the ethics. Uh, it's easy to pick up a new technology. It's hard to, uh, we, I think it's been amazing how many um, both makers and theorists have been actively thinking through the politics of, of, of this technology simply because just in the last three years, it went from, I think even in the last five years, I, I made a film on this wonky, huge camera. And then our mandate with Circle Visions was to say, let's learn how to do this with the very bare basics, with GoPro, with, um, with, with what we had access to, with open source technology, um, that was helping us craft 360 sound, you know, so it's, 
just in the last five years, we've seen this technology become increasingly accessible. And so then that asks us to be thinking in company with others about the ethics. So um, I don't know if there's any questions. Um, we'd be happy uh, to, to, to think together with you in the project you're working on or um, issues that you've heard about in, uh, or, or, or projects you've seen. Well, maybe I, I could just begin by saying a huge thank you, MMB and Liz, for such an amazing workshop. I was gripped from the moment you started talking, and, and I've been on Zoom a lot over the last few days. <laughs> it was just wonderful. You know, I, I've been very interested for a long time in the idea of situated knowledge, and you really made me think about this term situated presence uh, in a whole new way. And I, you know, I'm not exactly a technical person, but you, you really have, have tweaked my, my curiosity about the possibilities of immersive media and, and also the idea that it doesn't have to be a year long project, that it doesn't have to be a super expensive project, that it's something that you could with, with foresight and with some guidance, such as your expert guidance, put together. And I can't believe that your workshop participants put films together in five days and then they went on to win awards oh my god um but i can see how generative from your workshop how generative the possibilities are so you know i really loved some key things i loved from your workshop the idea this there's this ongoing question there's ongoing possibility about how 360 video can shift um, the perception and the perspective of power how revealing the process in these new media forms can be part of a feminist method. I hadn't thought about that before. You know, the, the VR I've seen is always, the whole goal has been to hide the mechanism of production. But of course, why do that uh, with one exception? Um, and I'm just drawing a blank on her name, but Shauna knows who I mean. <laughs> anyway, we'll come back to her. Um, and also how immersive media can implicate you in a charged space. So I, I just have loved all that. And I really appreciate that you've also ended your presentation with the ethical issues. And of course, they're, they're manifold. And I guess just one question I, I would have for you, and maybe other people will, this will get other people thinking about their questions too, is, you know, in a five-day workshop, I'm just curious as to whether your participants, you know, these young indigenous women, you know, what were some of the ethical issues that they brought forward or was everyone just so focused on, okay, let's get something made because we have this chance. Just curious as to how the, the ethical questions may have been part of your kind of mentoring landscape during that moment. Well, I want to say, I want to actually be honest here. Um, because it's, the, the, the workshop runs for five days, but these relationships have been building over five years. And I, I think that is so important. I don't think that we could make media without those pre-existing relationships. So Melina actually recycled a script that she worked on a year previously and reoriented it in a 360 space. And it's this poetic relationship to trees. And it, it's, it's such a beautiful script that it spoke to place. So she had the gift of like a year of distance in between bringing forth a story in her relationship to trees and then positioning that story in the 360 realm. Um, Emily was working with a, 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 an unbelievable uh, artist named Karen who, is, who takes you through a language lesson. And you see all of these Inuit, actually Emily's gonna describe it in a second, but uh, all these, um, in your words, you're, you're in a language class almost with her as this as this language comes into the city space and they didn't finish in the five day workshop. So then we held just a small weekend workshop with two weekends, two week, you know, no, so no, we, two days, two days, oh, two days, two days, yeah. you know, to finish the piece. So I don't like a lot can happen in five days, but it's 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 false to say that uh, everything happens in five days. Things spill over, and relationships are built over time. But I do that, yeah. I do feel though that I think <laughs> having that space at the beginning. So I like I really spoke to each person individually for like up to half an hour. So when Karen came, 
for instance, we had already had that, that connection. So it was really comfortable to speak together about language. And then the fact that she was talking, she's Inu, and she never learned her language because her father, partly because her father, um, she's my roommate now. So we've had a lot of conversations, but went through residential school. And so that means there was a really breakdown during the transfer of language. So I've always been, because I'm a Francophone, I, I have a lot of, I have a lot of empathy towards that loss of language and how connected it makes you feel culturally. And it's always blown my mind that as a, as a group, we're not more empathetic towards the loss of indigenous language because we fight so hard for our own. So also that common interest allowed us to build something really quickly. And we only spent seven days together, but you know, it made us close enough that we now both feel comfortable living together. But one of the things, especially when we were talking about Melina's piece and even Karen, is that we were asking them to talk, to like, to ground a story into place while they were away from the places they're actually connected to. So I know, Liz, you felt, you know, you were shooting on Mont Royal where Melina was talking about this, these trees that she's really connected to. And in like in the back, you can kind of see walkers. <laughs> You're like, okay, well, all right. And then for Karen, we recreated her apartment in my little brother's apartment. So we were struggling. She plays ukulele. So I was going around trying to find a ukulele to at least visually connect um, what she was trying to showcase. So that's an ethical, I feel, Liz, maybe you. No, it was huge for us. I mean, we realized that um, the technology that would help us crunch and make the films were not in the places where they needed to be to tell the best films, but at least we were rehearsing processes. Um, but yeah, we fictionalized the actual spaces. So there's a, there's a, there's a kind of um, fictional element to the space. Um, and that was a dissonance that we've talked about of uh, like, how would we do this in a way that we would actually be in the spaces so that the story also emerged from that place and would be uh, strengthened from that place. But it's a, I, th I see all of these as kind of rehearsal so that after, you know, the, there's a sort of more confidence with the, with the skills and the storytelling continues. And also it's not documentary, right? So it's um, it, it, what, what matters is making something happen, making somebody's creative idea come into reality and, and using what is at hand, which is also a feminist method, right? So I think it's okay if just for me, you know, it doesn't matter if it's the apartment necessarily, it's um, the storytelling, the visual and the narrative storytelling that is the, the agent of transformation. And, but and I, I'm, I'm gonna still think about your question of like, um, you know, do what they voiced as the sort of ethical considerations that were coming up for them. I feel like, uh, I think Naomi had some concerns yeah. about being about filming in a university yeah. sure. uh, space, yeah. which that was a bit difficult because part of our mission is to create that space yeah. Yeah. in a university, a kind of yeah. not safe space, but safer. Yeah. situation for people to to come to but there is still a lot of from yeah. one of our participants a lot of resistance towards that no it's super complicated the gray nun is where in the past we have uh you know had this access to rooms and it's like a haunted place and we've had deep conversations about this and so i think we've kind of figured out that we may not be able to hold workshops there in the past i don't know it, it's it's an ongoing conversation um like, what do you do where the colonial pasts have these traumatic contexts? So they're, unres you know, they're ongoing conversations. But I really appreciate that. I, I, first of all, I just appreciate all the feedback. Thank you, Cynthia. But also, the, that's a really critical question I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to think through. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. It's a long Zoom session. Thank you, everybody. I think... Uh, if you, if you wanted to reach out, uh, if anybody wants, we have training materials. We have a list of like a hundred projects we reviewed. Uh, we have lots of res resources. If anybody is thinking to do this kind of training um, or just needs a touch up, Emily made an entire guide of how to use a consumer VR um, camera like 
GoPro. So we're very, very, very happy to show them. Um, so you're I welcome. would love all that stuff. <laughs> Please okay. send me all that stuff right away. <laughs> okay. Well, Cynthia, I have your email. So anybody else who I don't know in advance, uh, please uh, let us know and uh, like that's the whole point is sharing what we've learned so far with as many people as we can it was just it was just wonderful I, and i can't resist saying um that for those of you who were as gripped as i was by this idea of you know the future as being part of feminist feminist research and creation and also um indigenous uh, resistance and uh, sovereignty that I think you'd be very interested in the podcast that we had um, that we pre-recorded as part of the Summer Institute. And I will just put that link in the chat. It's 26 minutes. You can listen to it anytime. Um, and it features also Bima Dashka Pukan, Saugeen First Nation scholar who's here, in fact, in this workshop today. So lots of um, points of connections between what Liz and Emily are sharing with us and, and that podcast. Thank you so much. That was just wonderful. Mm, thank you. <laughs> and I can't wait to listen to this podcast. Thank you so much for sharing that. And also it's true, Amanda Gutierrez is doing really cool work, uh, very personal embodied feminist VR work. So look out for her. Okay. Thank you, Thanks, Coates, Liz. as always. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Anna. Thank you everyone for being here. <laughs> Amazing. And so great to see so many familiar faces here. Uh, Liz, sure Emily, thank you, for leading us, uh, thank you for leading us. Thank you for leading us through this journey. It was uh, it was very rich, as I think all participants would attest to. Um, I'd also, if you permit me, just like to take this opportunity to underline the incredible amount of uh, work, creativity, hustle, outreach, planning, energy, oh, intellectual curiosity, all of the things that went into actualizing this series of events through the work of Cynthia Hammond and uh, Emma Harake. Thanks again, Cynthia, for allowing us to make the Summer Institute public virtually. We hope to have at least, we hope that you have at least 24 hours of nothingness planned in the very near future. And we look forward to working with you and the current CODES team again soon. So. Thanks everybody, enjoy your lunch and we hope to see you soon. Take good care, bye.